joined today by Ro Habibi from Million Dollar Listing San Francisco, the latest installment to the Bravo Reality Dynasty. Ro strives to be the best broker in his city. After a job with J.P. Morgan and then Vanguard Properties, he started to think bigger and joined Coldwell Banker Previews International, the only San Francisco real estate office to sell over $1 billion in annual sales. Roe has rapidly surpassed a tremendous amount of competition in his local market. Last year alone, he was rated in the top 6% of best brokers of San Francisco out of over 4,000 brokers. His drive for success and his passion for family, style, and of course, closing multi-million dollar deals make Roe Habibi a perfect addition to the ultra-competitive Bravo television series. Now, let's welcome Roe to the call as we join our host, Tim Harris. Hey, man, welcome to the call. Hey, good morning. How are you? Oh, it's my pleasure. So I'm going to start out with a kind of a fun question, and then we'll get to the pre-prepared questions that we sent to your publicist. Why is it that the Bravo chose you or asked you to be on the radio show? I'm sorry, on their TV show. Well, I'm not just a pretty face and a hot body. I sell a lot of real estate. <laughs> Yeah, man, that's right. But a lot of people do. So you obviously had, we were just talking about uh, the qualities that top producers have, but not just that, the qualities that some of the best agents in the country have. And obviously you have that, as I said before, that certain je ne sais quoi. I'm just wondering if they told you what the qualities were that they found attractive about you, whereas they chose you. Obviously they had a lot of other, you know, fantastic agents to choose from. Why did they choose you? Do you know? Well, you know, there is 4,100 agents in the San Francisco Association, and that's not even including the surrounding Bay Area like Marin or Silicon Valley and the East Bay. So they had a plethora of agents to choose from. Um, when I was in talks with them in the initial period of when they were looking for somebody, you know, they said they want someone charismatic. They want someone that they could grow with over the years, over the next couple of seasons. Um, you know, they're not looking for that cookie-cutter 60-year-old that, you know, sells $100 million worth of real estate every single year, that's not going to be entertaining. So, they, you know, they found my backstory to be very interesting, the fact that I'm from Afghanistan and, and born in Kabul, and, and now I'm working here as an Afghan-American and doing really well within the real estate industry. So th there were several different aspects that they liked about me and, and my personality type and the fact that I learned how to break pants and, and fun things like that that they thought might be very good for the show. I, I can definitely see that. Can, do you mind if you share? Was, we didn't talk at all about that. Talk a little bit about your personal background, just to add some color so people know you're not just a pretty face that can break dance. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I was I was born in Kabul, Afghanistan, um, during the war between the former USSR and Afghanistan um, in 1983. So my father was in the Army at the time, and basically when he got released off of his first tour, um, of, of helping with uh, with the war and everything like that, you know, he thought things were going to get just incredibly worse over the next couple of years with the way things were going at the time. So um, he and my mother, they decided that it'd be best for us to flee the country. So, um, you know, it was a very difficult period of their lives, basically packing up what they had in a couple of bags and, um, and being smuggled out of the country into a, a Pakistani refugee camp where we had to stay for several months. And, um, you know, we were basically applying for, for visas to come either to the United States, which all of my mother's whole family got a chance to come over here, or um, to Germany, which some other family members went to. So lucky enough for us, we, we got accepted to come over to the States, and, you know, they became citizens and all that type of good stuff and, you know, worked really, really hard in order to build some some form of a foundation for us as we were growing up and going to school and and I think that's one of the main reasons why I have, um, you know, we call it the immigrant drive, right? Your your parents gave up a lot in order to get you here to this point. So um, naturally, I just feel like I need to repay them with with uh, with success for everything that they gave up for me and for my family. You know, that's something that we see in coaching a lot. It's not something that, generally speaking, um, we talk about much, but there definitely is an immigrant drive. And it's really the foundation of the American dream, if you think about it. And when people refer to America as the land of opportunity, it really stems from that, the fact that we're from all over. You know, the country is basically made up of people like you, uh, you know, the immigrants. But there is, you know, and I'll be the one that says this, there is something that's lost over generations where people stop losing the drive that you obviously have. 
So, sure. I mean, how, how, how do I ask this question politely? Or maybe you could pick it up where I left it off because you know what I'm talking about. I mean, there is a certain quality about people that aren't born here, that move here, or their parents, in your case, you know, immigrated here. When you're, you know, you, you have the ability because you're an, you know, you, you are an American, you're very successful in, in an incredible part of the country, so you've kind of climbed the mountain. But when you're looking out at, of, at America and they're not, at, at, you know, you're, citizens that have been here for generations. What is it that's profoundly different in your eyes? Can you have you thought about that? Yeah, I, I think about that all the time. You know, because there there is no such thing as natives here in this land other than the Native Americans. All, all respect goes out to them because every single person that's living in this country now immigrated from somewhere. You're either from Germany or or Switzerland or France or Europe or something like that. No one is from here, right? So this country you know, kind of got built on the foundation of people coming over here to make something of themselves, to possibly build businesses and and, and create a legacy not only for themselves but for their family all, all the way down the line, right? So for um, what's going on right now in the States, you know, only 25% of, um, of kids are going to college in the whole entire United States. And that's, you know, 338 million people live here in the United States, and only 25% of them are even going to pursue higher education. Why is that? Um, you know, it could be some form of contentment, like, hey, you know, we, we have shelter, we have a decent amount of food, and there there isn't really um, that hunger or desire to pursue more. You know, some people may not want more, and then there's others like myself and, and many other immigrants that came here through a hardship and and they're thinking to themselves, hey, we have to create something that's going to last not only for myself and my kids, but will pass down on to the next generation. So I think some of the people that, you know, their family and their lineage may have already done that, they just they just don't have that drive anymore. It just kind of has gone away and dissipated away and they've found other things to keep them busy other than um, – wanting to pursue more. So uh, with your mindset, which is pretty much unstoppable, you can't have a more powerful mindset than what you just described, bro. So with your mindset, uh, you couldn't have selected a better city and a better industry to be in outside of had you thought of, like, you know, some great new, you know, Facebook type thing, right? I mean, you couldn't have <laughs> landed. You you couldn't have landed in a better place to sell real estate than San Francisco during this time in history with your mindset. So I think that's incredible, talking about things coming together, right? But it wasn't luck, obviously. You you chose to get into this industry. Talk to us about that. Why did you choose to get into real estate? Uh, that's a very good question. I, I question myself on why I did this. <laughs> 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 why, did I, why did I torture myself and get into this business? So I was working at J.P. Morgan Chase. I was working in finance before, and I did graduate school at Cal Berkeley, um, getting my certified financial planner certificate and, and really wanting to go deep into wealth management, financial planning, asset management, you know, tax and estate planning. That was kind of the route that I was going. They helped pay for schooling for me. You know, I got all my series licenses, six, 66, life and variable health, all that good stuff. So, you know, in, in my mind and in my brain, I knew that I wanted to do business. My undergraduate major was international business. So, I thought to myself, you know, commerce is something that's appealing to me. It's something that I'm interested in. I like economics. I like what's going on in the world and how everything affects each other. So I was enjoying working there, but not to the point where I felt fulfilled by any means. Building bank balances is a great thing. Helping other people invest is also, you know, a great thing. But I, I felt deep inside my heart that I just, it wasn't for me. So I was going into work too many days unhappy, and at one point or another, it just came to the point where I was thinking, hey, you know, my youth is wasting away, and I'm working at a job that I don't enjoy. If I'm going to make any type of changes, this is the ideal time to do it so I could, you know, build a solidified foundation and kind of move forward and continue growing. Um, luckily, I met a gentleman that was working in real estate for 15 years in one of my finance courses at Berkeley in grad school. So he, you know, was a very appealing guy, and I asked him, hey, do you mind if I take you to coffee and just kind of pick your brain on, on what the daily life is of a realtor? I, I, re I received my broker's license back in 2010, 
but I didn't even begin working in the business until April of 2012. So it took me a long time to, to take that leap of faith because it is such a difficult and ambiguous career because you're now on 100% commission. You know, I left the job that I was getting three paychecks a month, two and a commission and, and, you know, 401k and benefits and paid vacation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Granted, I was working many hours a week. I just felt like, you know, becoming an entrepreneur because that is what you are as a real estate agent. You're building a business from scratch. It took me a little bit of time in order to, to make that jump and, and switch on over. Well, do you also went from a very traditional sort of, I will use the word respectable with quotes around it, path, right? You went, you, you followed a more of a traditional sort of, I'm going to uh, obviously get a lot of education. I'm going to go down this sort of, you know, traditional financial planning path. And then you decide, well, heck with that. <laughs> I'm, going to, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get into real estate. But I, I have a feeling you, and I'm going to just put it out there, I, I bet I'm right. You chose real estate because you realized what a huge opportunity it was. Uh, and you probably, I'm guessing, also realized that for the most part, your immediate competitors weren't like you were competing against if you were sitting on, at a trading desk on Wall Street, right? I mean, the, oh, the, of the, course. Yeah. The, the nature of the competition in real estate is not as intense as it is in some of the other, in, in the path that you previously selected. Uh, true or false? Oh no, that's very true. Of course. Yeah, I mean, so that's kind of an interesting thing. That's the reason that in, <laughs> right now I cannot imagine a better industry to get into other than real estate because. We're in this long-term, you know, probably seven to ten-year really real estate boom again. Real estate prices, for the most part in the country, are fantastic, you, uh, and the barriers to entry are minimal. And for the most part, most of the agents out there, it's very few agents basically control the marketplace. So, at what point did you realize that you were on your way to becoming like really good at this? Was there like an epiphany where you had a certain number of closings happening or a certain amount of money pending? Or can you remember that moment? You know, there wasn't a specific moment, but but I w what I will tell you is this: you know, the national average for a price to buy a home, right, is two hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars. And at the peak of the last bubble in real estate, you know, interest rates were at six point four percent. So right now we have historically low interest rates. The price points are fantastic, and as Carnegie said, 90% of millionaires did so by owning and doing real estate transactions. It's the safest and best bet in order to build wealth. As we can see right now with the, with the market, you know, there's been having really big problems because of international factors, and people are losing a lot of money. With real estate, it's a tangible asset that you could live in, you could enjoy for quite some time, and... You know, there is no guarantees in life, but it's pretty much guaranteed that 10 years from now, your house is probably going to be worth more than it was when you bought it. So it's a pretty safe investment. Um, if, for no, if, for no other reason, if for no other reason than inflation, right? I mean, Julie and I exactly. sold real estate in Columbus. Yeah, I mean, so inflation is going to bring the value up, right? I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but what you just said is yeah. so true, and a lot of people don't recognize that, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's a great thing to put your money in. It's a little bit safer, I mean, a lot safer than the than the stock market and, and things of that nature. And it's a great way for you to build wealth in order to be able to move on to your next venture. And, and you know, there's, there's different ways that you could leverage it. You could definitely, you could rent it out. You could put some money in to fix that property up and gain value that way. Obviously, the, the acquisition of value just over the years. And also, you could leverage the money that you have in a home to take out you know, debt in order to do your next venture or buy another property. So there's there's different ways that you could take advantage of this. And these are some of the things that, you know, were appealing to me about real estate in general. You know, from a financial, your background being trained to basically be a financial advisor, which I didn't know about you, which is, it's interesting. We've had financial advisors on the radio show before. And the thing is that uh, they try to sell, for the most part, people into not investing in real estate or not seeing or seeing real estate as riskier than it is. And I always ask them this question as politely as I can: Can you sell me any sort of security other than you know call real estate a security that you can depreciate, that appreciates, and it also produces produces cash flow for you, assuming you bought it? Right? <laughs> no, there you know. there is no such thing. There is no, there such, is no thing. such thing. Right, no. just real estate. <laughs> I know that's kind of funny. <laughs> that sells itself, right? So what exactly. if you so for we have 
typically we'll have like 100,000 agents listed on this. We're going to submit this to Inman. Inman's going to, you know, generate who knows how many more tens of thousands of listeners. So all, all these agents listening, they're always going to want to know the same thing. What do you do to generate leads? That's the main question. The agents love that question. I'm sure you get that all the time. You probably yeah, you probably listen for that too. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the golden question in real estate, right. and that is the way that you are going to survive. My, you know, so okay, so there's there's a couple of different ways of thinking about this. When I first started in the business, um, there was 14 other agents that started with me in the training program that I was in. There was like an eight-week training program at the firm that I was working with. And, you know, there was 14 of us agents there. And uh, the trainer, she said, okay, you know, look to the left of you and look to the right of you. Within three years, one of you are not going to be there. It's either going to be you or it's going to be that person. And what truly ended up happening is 12 of those people ended up disappearing within, you know, getting to that three-year mark. Myself and one other gentleman that had been doing commercial real estate for 30 years we're the only two that survived. I don't know why. It's it's such a difficult business. And the main thing is lead generation. So my main objective well, every single day you, just, just for the sake just for the sake of our listeners, you said I don't know why, but but you do. You do know why. You do know why that those other agents uh I mean if we're being honest, right? You know why they weren't willing to that why they didn't stick around, because they weren't willing to do what you were willing to do. They weren't willing to do it at the level that you were willing to do. True or false? That's very true. You have and to so, treat it as a yeah, you have to treat yep. it as a business. You have to wake up early. You have to do an incredible amount of research. You have to learn the market, meaning knowing your inventory like the back of your hand. Know what's on the market, know what just sold. Know the price that it sold for, know what neighborhood it is. What's going on in that neighborhood? What's the demographic that lives there? The way that you learn the market well is by property tour. I think they call it caravan in a lot of other places. You know, you could look on MLS as much as you'd like, but without walking into a property, smelling it, feeling it, touching it, you cannot explain that and do justice to your clients because you haven't seen it. You don't know what's different about that property that just sold down the road compared to the one that you're doing a listing pitch for if you haven't seen it. So don't do yourself a disservice by not knowing your inventory. You have to know your inventory, and that's one of the leading causes for success in this business. I totally agree. So I'm I'm actually writing these things down for our show description. So you have know your inventory, know the market cold, so getting back to lead generation, obviously if people yeah. know that you are an expert, if they know you're actually somebody they can go to and talk about virtually any aspect of real estate, that in itself is going to be an attractor. So in a way, know, being a, market, a true market expert, that generates leads for you because people know that you're a reliable source of information. But overt, go, overtly going after the business, describe what you do for that. Yeah, so after becoming that credible source and knowing knowing the market, knowing real estate, being able to answer anybody's question at any time, at a cocktail event, at your kid's birthday party, at Chuck E. Cheese, <laughs> wherever you are, you have to know all that, right? So the main thing that I think you could do in order to generate business, just right off the bat as you're beginning in the business, is one, do not be a secret agent. <laughs> many people many people do this. You get your license, you just made a career transition, you're scared, you don't want to let people know that you're in the business, you think because you're so green and you're so new, no one's going to want to use you, and if they do use you, you don't want to make a mistake. There's two ways to overcome that. One, you could bring in somebody from the office that's more experienced than you. You could say, hey, listen, I have a client, they want to buy a, this much amount of a home in this area, you have been doing this for far longer than I have. Why don't we work this together? We'll split it 50-50. Don't worry about money. Don't worry about commission. Split it 50-50 and say, while we're doing the process, I want to learn everything that I can from you. Would you agree to that? I don't think anyone in your office is going to turn down a 50% commission basically for free. So team up with people. Don't be afraid to do that. It's very important for you to learn the business. The learning curve in real estate, I don't care what anybody says, it's a minimum of five years. It will take you five years to learn this business because it's every single transaction is different. There's so many different factors that affect a transaction, age of a home, different types of 
you know, disclosures that you're going to need to do, different types of inspections. Also, you know, if you're dealing with the 1031 exchange, if you're dealing with a trust, if you're dealing with a bankruptcy, every single one of these things are going to affect the transaction in a way that you don't know. So you have to learn by doing these transactions. And the main thing that you could do as you're starting is, they always say this, but reach out to your sphere of influence. That means mom, dad, aunts, uncles, your barber, every single person that you know. Let them know that you're in real estate and let them know that you're willing to help anybody. It doesn't matter what the price point is. It doesn't matter where it is. You're a brand new agent, so you can't pick and choose. You work everything, every day, in every way. So when you reach out to that sphere of influence, the, the main ones that you see that are actually – becoming an advocate for you and kind of referring you business, maybe one or two here, those people become your A-plus clients. Now, what that means is you are taking them to lunch. You're taking them to baseball games and basketball games. You're, you're sending the wife over to, you know, a spa day. These are people that you actually care about, you know, you guys have dinners together, you guys are friends, and they become your number one advocates. When you're not working – hanging out at home, they're out talking to other people like, hey, you know, if you're going to be buying a place, you should definitely use so-and-so. He's an amazing agent or she's an amazing agent. And, you know, that that's basically going to become one of your go-to people that are going to be bringing you business. Now, if you create five or 10 or 15 of these A-plus clients, I mean, that could be enough for you to survive and be living very well. It's true. And, you know, that's always, we talk about that. I love how you said, don't be a secret agent. That actually, that phrase came from a guy named uh, Howard Britton, who passed away a few years ago. But yeah, that's funny. I love hearing you say that. And as far as the centers of influence and past clients, that is absolutely uh, a primary spoke or lead source of leads that every agent should be pursuing. And I also appreciate the fact that you did say that it takes years to get to know a market, but that's especially true in your market because San Francisco is cray-cray with all the rules, you know, the different colored parking <laughs> stickers and the, the amount of stuff you guys have to know, the bus routes that are now uh, because they go by certain, you know, tech places where people work are causing the real estate values to increase all these little nuances of every particular market. So in an in a area like San Francisco, that's changing so fast. That's just so incredibly diverse. Do you focus on the whole city, or do you consider yourself an expert in a particular area? How do you, how do you decide where to focus in? Yeah, so San Francisco in general is not that large. It's only seven miles by seven miles. So I work the whole city. You could zip around the whole entire town and, you know, in 20 minutes getting from one side all the way to the other side. And the amount of real estate that is available for sale here is only about 850,000 units. So it's not that many. So you could zip around the city, you could learn the markets, you could learn the neighborhoods. Um, right now, you know, the biggest trend is people want to live where all the amenities are. You know, they want to walk outside of their door to the best coffee shop and, and hang out at the park on the weekends. And this is funny, but they play dodgeball on the, uh, on the basketball courts. It's just it's a funny town, man. They're, the people that are living here, they're young, they're energetic, they're very motivated. It's the true innovators that are that are creating, you know, what's going to revolutionize the future. And they want to have fun and they want to enjoy themselves and they want to be where everything is. How does, uh, with the prices going through the roof, are you, what, 20, 30% appreciation rates, true appreciation, not inflation. Isn't that kind of the norm, at least for the past few years in some parts of the yeah, city? Yeah, so... Yeah, so um, this year we're about 19% year over year from last year. And Incredible. last year, again, we were yeah, probably in about that 30% range. So the price points in the Bay Area, which is the East Bay, Marin County, San Francisco, and going down to the, the Silicon Valley and South Bay, from Case Schiller, it's up 52% since 2010. So in the past five years, you could have doubled your money if you would have bought real estate here in the Bay Area. What has that done for the people that – obviously, you're, it's pricing a lot of people out of the ever being able to buy a home. What's the, aver, what's the average sale price right now in just San Francisco on a whole? Not going down to Marin County, not spreading it out across the bridge, but what's the actual average sale price that someone's paying for condo, house, blended value? 1.1. 1.1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. Yeah, 1.1 1. 1 to 1.2. 
So you have to have some pretty good net worth or a really well-paying job to be able to qualify for that, which must leave a lot of, um, I mean, socially, that must be creating a lot of tension in the marketplace of people that can and can't, right? Certainly, and this is something that I really do want to address. So the the concept of gentrification and what's kind of going on in San Francisco, um, it is true in some areas, but in many of the areas it's not. If you're going to be buying a home in the Sunset, if you're going to be buying a home in, in areas like Alamo Square or or the Western Edition or, you know, the the shipyard and all these other places, the price points are extremely affordable. You could get, you know, two bedroom, two baths for $800,000. You could buy a single family home for maybe like $900,000. You're laughing because it seems high, but for me, it's like... No, I'm laughing because hey, you know the cheap, average sale price of the, the, the average... So, <laughs> Because I know our listeners are saying, does this guy not know that the country the average sale price is two hundred grand? <laughs> I, yeah. So, I was, so yeah. I do. I do. I do apologize to the rest of the nation. I'm just kind of talking about our, our market here. Right. Sure. Uh, so, so yeah. So this is the thing. Okay. If there, if there are people being priced out of places like San Francisco, what's kind of becoming the norm now is we have a city that's across the the Bay Bridge from us. It's called Oakland. Uh, many of you may have heard of it before. The, the Warriors Stadium was over there, and they just won the championships for the NBA this year. So what people are doing is Oakland is becoming our new Brooklyn. Like if San Francisco was Manhattan, Oakland would be becoming our new Brooklyn. So a lot of people, they're moving over to Oakland. There's beautiful homes over there. You get a lot more square footage. You get a lot more, you know, bang for your buck, I would say. And it's a it's a fun place. There's great restaurants and cafes and boutique shopping and they have an art murmur every single month mm-hmm. where every single art gallery is open and there's live bands. So there's a lot of fun stuff for people to be doing. That doesn't mean that you necessarily have to live in San Francisco proper to get around the Bay Area. It's a short drive everywhere. It's not like Los Angeles where you're sitting in three hours of traffic. You could zip across the whole entire Bay Area in 45 minutes getting across the whole entire Bay Area. So if you don't have to live in San Francisco, you could live on the peninsula, you could live in the East Bay, you could live in actual Silicon Valley. There, there's so many different places to live where you're not going to be affected as much by, you know, the higher price points and I guess the gentrification that's kind of going on. Like my family, I have a wife and I have a nine-month-old daughter. We were living in San Francisco, you know, since 2008 in the Mission, and then we lived in a place called Alamo Square in Hayes Valley, and then after that we moved over to the marina. But when we when we were about to have the baby, my wife said, look, we need more space. I want something more, you know, beneficial for all of us. So we ended up moving to the East Bay to a city called Hayward. So we got a single-family house over here. You know, it's four-bedroom, three-bath. It has a two-car garage and a backyard. And you could get something like that in the 500000 You know, it's interesting listening to you talk. You really are a, a market expert. I mean, you were able just to, in and, and a very, well, but seriously, in a very short period of time, I hope our listeners are getting that too. You just were able to basically talk about this huge swath of real estate, and you sound, and, and the information you gave comparing and contrasting and everything you were saying, it was, it, it was fantastic. I hope the listeners are really getting the fact that what he said so true. And again, it's, it's worth repeating even for a third time. One of the primary goals of everyone should be to know your inventory and know it like he knows his. Know the marketplace. Know the pluses and the minuses. Don't ever be – and if you guys are finding yourselves wanting or not not willing to be uh, out there letting folks uh, know that you're uh, here to help people buy and sell real estate, if you find yourself being that secret agent, uh, listen to what he just said. It comes from your lack of confidence because you don't know your inventory. You don't know the marketplace. So, so listen, as we round the bend today, I, I, first of all, I want to say congratulations on all your success. I mean, honestly, man, it's fantastic. Congratulations for being one of the latest uh, Bravo uh, TV stars. By the way, I'm curious, did you network, have you networked yet with the other uh, guys and gals that are in similar positions in different cities around the country? Do you know them yet? Um, no, very, very briefly, we met Josh Altman and Josh Flagg at the NBC Universal um, we did a press event. We did some stuff for Bravo, like taking photos and video and all that. So we met them briefly over there. And um, my family, we took a vacation to Miami a couple weeks ago, and I got a chance to meet mm-hmm. uh, Chris Leavitt, who is just He's a great, stellar he? guy. He's oh, yeah. such an amazing guy. Yeah. So we had lunch together, and he was saying, hey, you know, get ready for things to change. <laughs> I was like, oh, yep, boy, yep. this is going to be crazy. 
<laughs> well, I'll tell you something funny. So we've interviewed, and, and, and if you want me to help you connect with those guys in New York, too, they're great because they've been kind of at it long enough that now they'll be able to tell you the pluses and the minuses. But here's the funny thing. I, was, I won't name names, but I've asked all of them this question, and you haven't been doing this long enough. I think the first airing of the show was just last night. Um, but I asked one of them once. I said, so did you get any business from the show? And he went on and told me, oh, no, no, we don't get it. And then um, we, you know, I, asked, I always ask that question. So I asked Madison Hildebrand that question. I asked Frederick the question. I asked Chris the question. I, you know, and they all say, are you kidding me, dude? I'm all over TV. Of course I'm getting freaking leads from that. Are you kidding? What kind of questions that? <laughs> yeah. So well, the amount exciting. of inquiries you're – yeah, well, you'll get listings just because you're on the TV show. But still, if you don't have the skill set that you have, if you're not able to present, if you don't have, which obviously you're able to do all these things. So even the best opportunity guys, if you're not able to basically match it with uh, an equal level of skill, you're not going to get that business because people are very sophisticated anymore. So as we round the bend on today's show, anything you'd like to say to the tens of thousands of listeners that I'm sure have become your fans? Well, I just want to say thank you to every single person that's taken time out of your crazy busy lives, one, to watch the show or to follow me on any of the social media platforms. And thank you so much for all of your kind messages that everyone sent over. There's been an overwhelmingly positive response to the show and to myself in general. Um, I'm happy to answer as many emails and phone calls and and text messages as I possibly can if anyone wants to get in touch with me. this is it's a true honor and I'm very blessed and um yeah I just want to thank everyone this is this has been such an amazing thrilling ride and I, I look forward to see what the future holds and um don't don't be afraid to just go out there and do what others are not willing to do in order for you to not only survive in this business but thrive good luck to I everybody I love that man I love that. That's beautiful. So thank you again for being uh, my co-host on today's radio show. And listeners, <laughs> he said it. If you want to get hold of him, we're going to include a link to his website in today's show description. Um, so, yeah, reach out to him. And obviously, guys, do be considerate of the fact that he's extremely busy. And if you have any uh, folks that are destined to buy or sell in that particular market, consider sending your leads to him. I'm sure he'd be very appreciative, and obviously he'd take fantastic care of them. So everyone, thanks for listening, and we'll talk talk with you on the radio tomorrow.